I was considering recently the concept of inheritance. And I was thinking about what have I inherited? And I actually thought of this ring. Can you all see that ring today? It's a little bit bigger for my, than my ring finger, so I, I got it here. Honestly, I never wear it. It came from my father-in-law when he died. And it's special. Uh, it has their wedding diamond in it. And it's, it's important, but just looking at it makes me think of that thought of inheritance. I don't even know that he left it to me. It was in the house <laughs> and we were rummaging through things and it was like, anybody want this? And Val was like, I, Rob will take that. But nonetheless, today I realize it's an inheritance. The diamond represented a covenant. And that covenant produced my wife. So there's importance in this inheritance, but there's importance in the inheritance the Lord has for us as well. We talk a lot about inheritance from time to time, but there's certain things involved in it. Well, at best, they're difficult. They're painful. It's true that by being born, we're qualified for an inheritance just at birth. However, keeping that inheritance is actually something very different from that. Holding on to it. Research has shown even that those who aren't well-groomed and prepared to receive an inheritance tend to lose it quickly. And in fact, those that receive a large sum after the death of a relative that they weren't prepared to receive usually keep it less than two years. It's spent wildly and it's gone. But Scripture has a lot to say about inheritance. There's birthing, and that in one way qualifies us, it's true. There's obtaining, there's maintaining the inheritance as well. And all of this is talked about in Scripture. First, just a little introduction. In Scripture, there were those that despised their inheritance or their birthright. In Genesis 25, verses 32 through 34, it says, Esau said, I am about to die. Of what use is a birthright or an inheritance to me? Jacob said, swear to me now. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. And Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew. And he ate and drank and rose and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. He despised it. If we're not careful... We can despise the birthright along the way, can't we? Because maybe some of the things that the Lord gives us to chew on, well, they're just not very easy. And that's part of the process of receiving the birthright. We can despise if we're not careful. And we know in the story that Esau, he never made an attempt to repent or to go back. He just didn't have any appreciation for it. He actually was put out of the way, we could say, because he despised what was really a holy thing for him or should have been a holy thing for him. It was, if I could say, the diamond ring that came to him, the diamond ring of promise, and yet he despised it. We also see in Scripture there were those who squandered their inheritance, they spent it quickly. In Luke chapter 15, Jesus tells a story, verses 11 through 13. There was a man who had two sons, and the younger said them to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. Give me my inheritance now. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all that he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property, in reckless living. So he got the inheritance, didn't he? But he didn't hold on to it for very long. He didn't possess the real promise that should have been destined to him. Now it's interesting when we look at the attitudes of the two brothers. One of them just quickly wasted it away. The other one... There's a lot of ways to interpret it, but we can say it was difficult for him to swallow the event as well. 
because of what his brother had done. He, he couldn't quickly forgive, at least in the same way the father could. It had affected him as well. So we see our attitude about inheritance is very, very important. Do we realize the Lord has an inheritance for us? What are we going to do with it? But also, what are we going to do, if I could put it this way, for it? Now, we've got to put this in the context of Scripture, but there is a process that I believe the Lord takes every one of us through if we're going to receive the promise that He have, has for us. And I'd like to focus in the text this morning on a story in the book of Ruth about somebody who actually greatly valued an inheritance. In Ruth chapter 4, verses 1 through 12, and it's a bit of a long piece of text, but we're going to read it. It says, Now Boaz had gone up to the gate and sat down there, and behold, the Redeemer of whom Boaz had spoken came by. So Boaz said, Turn aside, friend, sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. And he took men, ten men of the elders of the city and said, Sit down here. And so they sat down. And he said to the Redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from the country of Moab, is selling the parcel of land that belonged to our relative Elimelech. So I thought I would tell you of it and say, Buy it in the presence of those sitting here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not, tell me that I may know, for there is no one beside you to redeem it, and I come after you. And he said, I will redeem it. That was his first response. It's an interesting one, but it wasn't the whole story. He said, I will redeem it. There were some strings attached. Then Boaz said, the day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you also acquire Ruth the Moabite the widow of the dead, in order to perpetrate the name of the dead in his inheritance. Then the Redeemer said, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I impair my own inheritance. So he had an inheritance coming already, and he was given this second opportunity. Could I say for a better inheritance? But for him, it didn't appear that way. It didn't appear that way at all. And there was a price that he had to pay for it, too, to get that second inheritance. And that was not easy. Then the Redeemer said, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I impair my own inheritance. Take my right of redemption yourself, for I cannot redeem it. Now, this was the custom in former times in Israel concerning redeeming and exchanging to confirm a transaction. One drew off his sandal and gave it to the other. And this was the manner of attesting in Israel. So then the Redeemer said to Boaz, buy it for yourself. He drew off his sandal. Then Boaz said to the elders and all the people, you are witness this day that I have bought from the hand of Naomi all that belonged to Elimelech and all that belonged to Chilon and to Malon. Also Ruth the Moabite, the widow of Malon, I have bought to be my wife, to perpetrate the name of the dead in his inheritance and the name of the that the name of the dead may not be cut off among his brothers and from the gate of the native place you are witnesses this day then all the people who were at the gate and the elders said we are witnesses may the lord Make the woman who is coming into your house like Rachel and Leah who together built up the house of Israel may you act worthily in Ephrata, and be renowned in Bethlehem. May your house be like the house of Perez, with whom Tamar bore Judah, because of the offspring that the Lord will give you by this young woman. Boaz the Redeemer paid the price to receive a promise, to receive an inheritance. With that, he also married Ruth. It was a package deal, you might say. The first thing that we look from this is there's always a cost in redemption. There's always a cost in redemption. And I'd like to primarily look at Christ for us. 
There was a cost that he paid for us. Now, this time of year, we remember that just because of the seasonal events happening this week. But do we really cherish the cost that he paid for me, Rob Tucker? That he paid for you? In Colossians 1.13, He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. There's always that cost for redemption. And He paid that price for us. Now, that's a very simple, basic thing that we all realized. Realize, hopefully, each and every day. But do we cherish the cost of that? Do we cherish the cost of that? We celebrate his death every time we celebrate communion. He rose again and we're thankful for that. We celebrate that as well. But do we weigh the cost often of what he did for us? Now, how we weigh that cost is by responding in obedience. I've had this conversation with a number of people lately. We all have ideas, don't we? We have good ideas. We have bad ideas. Most of my ideas, I run past my wife first because I know somewhere around 96% of them, she's going to go, yeah, bad idea. We need to move on. We all have ideas. Do you have ideas about the way things should be done? We all have ideas, don't we? But the question is, what do you do with them? And are you going to follow in and obey what the Lord is saying? Because our ideas can come in and take over if we're not careful, and they'll cost us the inheritance. They'll cost us a different direction. We've got to be careful. Jesus paid a redeeming price for us that we could follow him. And proof of that following in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. Yeah, you can have ideas. Go ahead, have your ideas. But how are you going to follow? How are you going to follow through? For you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. There's also a cost in the process of redeeming others. And actually, we're part of that, aren't we? The Lord has redeemed us, hasn't he? But there's a cost in seeing that redemption even flow to others. There's a cost in prayer. I think there's also a cost in the willingness to suffer for others. Quite frankly, this is very pertinent to me this morning, looking at my dad's situation and his health right now. There's a cost related to all of that. Are we willing to carry that cost? The cost of redemption. The cost of redemption in Philippians 1, 6, and 7. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. For it is right for me to feel this way about all of you because I hold you in my heart. He was paying the price, wasn't he? For you are all partakers of me, with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. He was saying there's a price for this redemption to come. And if that's going to flow through us, there is a price to pay. Now, I'd like to make this comparison this connection, this correlation between a redemptive process and really the process of obtaining an inheritance. Because in some ways, they're related if they're not the same thing. Obtaining an inheritance also costs something. If we're going to obtain the inheritance and then maintain the inheritance over time. There may be many who don't want to pay that price. In going back and looking at that story in Ruth, in chapter 4 and verse 6, it says, Then the Redeemer said, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest 
I impair my own inheritance. Take my right of redemption for yourself, for I cannot redeem it. There is a cost for us to pay if we're going to inherit the promises. Don't you like hearing that? Have you felt that lately? Have you felt the cost lately? I have. A a whole bunch, actually. And it makes you begin to question, well, is it worth it? That's one of those ideas that pop into our head. One of those 96% ideas. Yeah, that's just a bad idea. (laughs) But those things come, and those are realities for us. It's best, and sometimes we admit that, and say, Lord, I can't do it. There's just disaster in front of me. (laughs) But that's when he's able to show up. Because he ultimately has paid the cost. To the children of Israel, the promised land was a part of their inheritance, but they still had to dispel the enemies. The price was big for them to inherit the land. It took years, actually, for them to conquer. In this story of Ruth, Boaz had to assess his reputation and his personal vision. He was going to be marrying a Moabite woman. That was bad news, wasn't it? And yet, that was part of the package deal of receiving the inheritance. And he was willing to give that up. There was also a cost, if we look deeper in the story earlier in the chapters, that Ruth had to pay, wasn't there? She followed her mother-in-law. I don't know many young women, especially young widowed women, who would simply follow their mother-in-law. There had to be a price. We know her mother-in-law was bitter, and she was pretty happy to tell everybody about it. I don't know if you've had a mother-in-law that's bitter, bitter and happy to tell you about it, but that wouldn't be pleasant. We've all heard of stories, probably seen movies, where a person is in line to receive an inheritance, but they have to go through a number of steps in order to complete the process. A number of qualifying things so that they will actually receive what, the, what their ancestor has for them. But also, an inheritance affects not only the living but also those who have passed on before us. In verse 9, it says, Then Boaz said to the elders and all the people, You are witnesses this day that I have brought from the land of the hand of Naomi all that belonged to Elimelech and all that belonged to Chilion and to Malon. Also Ruth the Moabite, the widow of Malon, I have bought with my life to perpetuate the name of of the dead in his inheritance, that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brothers and from the gate of his native place. You are witnesses this day. Now, Boaz was doing this to fulfill scripture. Way back in Deuteronomy chapter 25, verses 5 and 6, there was a command given that if someone died, the close relative was to take over the marriage, if I could say, and raise up children in the name of the deceased. It was put into effect to assure that family names would go on. Boaz, looking at this situation, could have said, you know what, I want kids in my own name. (laughs) Wouldn't that have been reasonable? Wouldn't it? And yet, he took on that duty giving the credit to someone else, giving the credit to those who had gone on before him. Boaz was completing the inheritance of those who had gone before him. There's a connection for all of us when we inherit the promises or move into inheriting the promises that it affects not only us, but it affects those around us. I don't remember if it was in a book or if it was in a uh, 
a sermon that I was listening to online recently by Pastor Bailey. And this was later in his life, and he was talking about having some visions of heaven and uh, some of the inheritance he was going to receive there. And he, he saw a horse there that was going to be his in eternity. And he was struck not just with the beauty of the horse, but the realization that the horse's inheritance was very much tied up with what he got accomplished here on earth and whether he obtained the prize in the end. It was going to affect that horse for eternity. Now that's one I haven't thought about before. Um, I guess my thought is I, I would rather have a tractor. But, but there's that fact of what happens right now, what we're involved in right now, is affecting those who are behind us and those who are around us and those who are after us. Boaz recognized that. He realized that he was purchasing this inheritance to affect those former generations. And in fact, when they pronounce blessings at the end of this text, they go all the way back to the patriarchs with it. Where are the blessings? Because it was going to affect things later on. He was concerned about that continuity. Finally, what is our inheritance? We like to look to a lot of different things and say, well, I'd like to inherit this or I'd like to inherit that. I'd like to be involved in this or that. But I think so. it's so easy, at least for me, and I think it's probably that way for you as well, to assume the wrong things are actually the inheritance. Some of the things that we assume are the inheritance are actually the tools that the Lord wants to use to help us get to the inheritance. And we mix those things up at times. And it becomes confusing for us. In Ephesians 1, 11 and 12, what is our inheritance? If in Him we have ob obtained an inheritance. Having been predestined according to the purpose of Him who works all things according to the counsel of His will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of His glory. In Him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in Him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it, to the praise of His glory. It's easy for us to look at world events or events in our churches, events in Starville, events of who shows up and who doesn't show up, in trying to say what our inheritance is. And those things are certainly a part of what we're doing, right? Do we have a responsibility to minister? We do. I had the opportunity to participate in a funeral on uh, Saturday. And uh, I had the opportunity to speak to a lot of people that would never come to church. That, that Jesus is alive and he wants a personal relationship with us. I'm thankful for that opportunity. But that opportunity is not the inheritance, is it? And many times we confuse some of these things, even ministry that we're involved in, saying that's our inheritance. When that is really meant to be a vehicle to get us to the inheritance, to get us to the end of the road, to get us to that place that the Lord has for us in the end, because it says here, in Him, we have obtained an inheritance. In Him, we have that inheritance. It's, it's He. He is the one we are searching for. He is the one that we must obtain. It's not some process. It's, it's not the process. It's not the things that we're engaged in. It's not the tools that He gives us along the way. It's not the joy of the experiences. And those things can be great at times. But in the end... It's Him, isn't it? 
He's got to be the, the inheritance that we're searching for. Romans 4, 13, for the promise of Abraham and his offspring that he would be heir of the world did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. Luke 18, verses 18 through 23, and the ruler asked him, good teacher, what must I do? And he uses these words to inherit eternal life. The Lord then repeats some commandments to him. He says, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. And he said, all these I have kept from my youth. When Jesus heard this, he said to them, oh, one other thing you lack. Sell all that you have and distribute it to the poor. Then you will have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. This guy had gotten caught up in all the trappings that he thought was his inheritance. He placed them in the wrong category in his head, where the inheritance was right in front of him. It was Jesus. And Jesus knew that he, if he could simply leave those things, that he would see the real inheritance. Philippians 3, 8, Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. There was a price, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. In conclusion, Boaz redeemed this family property, but he truly gained a spiritual inheritance, didn't he? Now, when we, in looking at this story, walking along the way through it, we could have come to the conclusion, well, I'm not sure he's making a good idea. That's my idea. I'm not sure that's, this is a good idea he's doing this. What is he giving up? He could lose his own inheritance, his own promises. He could have had an attitude like the closer relative had. Yet the fact was, he was willing to pay the price of all of that, wasn't he? To obtain what was real. He married Ruth, and the end of the story didn't end in Ruth. The fact is, when we go to the Gospels, in two of the Gospels, the lineage of Christ is mentioned. And who's there? Boaz is there. He won Christ. In the end, he won Christ. He made the right choice. He didn't let the thinking along the way divert him, but he obtained the real inheritance that mattered in the end. He was in the lineage the other guy's name, who knows? Even Ruth's husband, first husband, Naomi's first husband, things changed, didn't they? But he was in the lineage. He obtained Christ. I'm struck with that for every one of us today. And, you know, the price of an inheritance. The price of an inheritance. I think in one sense, we all have already been promised an inheritance. I think in, in some relative sense, that's true. I think the question is of maintaining the inheritance, but also in the case of Boaz, that maybe the Lord even wants to broaden that inheritance. But it's easy to come up with all these questions and all these reasons, and we have good reasons. A lot of people around us lately have had really good reasons, but they were just wrong. The question is, are we going to obtain Christ? That's got to be the focus for every one of us. We want all of these other things along the way, don't you? <laughs> I do, actually. But in the end, we want to obtain him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, 
Lord, we want our hope to be in you. We don't even want our hope to be in what you can do or what we believe you're going to do. We want our hope to be in you. Because if we get our eyes on these other things, we come up with wrong ideas, wrong thinking. And it takes us the wrong way. And we won't obtain you in the end. So, Lord, I say for myself, I want you, Lord. Lord, would you bring down the wrong thinking? The wrong thinking that comes from inside as well as outside. Lord, that would have us focus on the tools that you're using in our life that we might win you. Because in the end, we want to win you. Lord, I ask for that reality in my life and for all of our lives here this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.